We're continuing with Walden and Thoreau. Walden's under David Thoreau's Walden Pond with the ponds. <laughs> but he says ponds and there's more than one pond. And I never found that picture of me inside Walden Pond with the copy of Walden. Sometimes, having had a surf fight of human society and gossip and worn out all my village friends, I rambled still farther westward than I habitually dwell to yet more unfrequented parts of the town, to fresh woods and pastures new, or while the sun was setting, made my supper of huckleberries and blueberries on Fair Haven Hill, and laid up a store for several days. Do you know what rambling is? <laughs> it's like wandering around, rambling. You just walk a few, few long flowers for you. Don't go with the plan. Mm. I used to hunt, hunt, pick blueberries uh, myself in the woods. The fruits do not yield their true flavor to the purchaser of them, nor to him who raises them for the market. There is but one way to obtain it, but few take that way. That's why they have pick your own fairy farms. <laughs> well, you're going to taste it right off the stem. <laughs> but then you eat it while you're picking it. Hmm. If you were, would know the flavor of huckleberries, ask the cowboy or the partridge. It is the vulgar error to suppose that you have tasted huckleberries who never plucked them. If you haven't plucked them, you haven't tasted them. You could go to Ohio and go berry picking one day. A huckleberry never reaches Boston. They have not been known there since they grew on her. Free Hills, the ambrosial and essential part of the fruit is lost with the bloom, which is rubbed off in the market cart, and they become mere provind vendor. As long as eternal justice reigns, not one innocent huckleberry can be transported thither from the country's hills. See, he's into um, fresh food that's so fresh that <laughs> see, I claim it should be fresh within one hour of the store, but he's saying it should be on the spot in the woods. Uh -huh. Occasionally, after my hoeing was done for the day, I joined some impatient companion who had been fishing on the pond since morning, as silent and motionless as a duck or a floating leaf, and after practicing various kinds of philosophy, had concluded commonly, by the time I arrived, that he belonged to the ancient sect of Cenobites. There was one older man, a frequent, an excellent fisher, and skilled in all kinds of woodcraft who was pleased to look upon my house as a building erected for the convenience of fishermen. It's just that they have fishing houses. They have little huts on the ice sometimes. Fishermen make a, put a hut on the ice fishing. Maybe. And I was equally pleased when he sat in my doorway to arrange his lines. Once in a while, we sat together on the pond, he at one end of the boat and I at the other, but not many words passed between us, for he had grown deaf in his later years, but he occasionally hummed a psalm, which harmonized well enough with my philosophy. 
Our intercourse was thus altogether one of unbroken harmony. Far more pleasing to remember than if it had been carried on by speech, when, as was commonly the case, I had none to commune with. I used to raise the echoes by striking with a paddle on the side of my boat, filling the surrounding woods with circling and dilating sounds, stir stirring them up as the keeper of the menagerie of his wild beast, until I elicited a growl from my heavy wooded bell and hillside. Are you going to make coffee? No. In warm evenings, I frequently sat in the boat playing the flute. The flute he played. And saw the birch, which I seemed to have charmed, hovering around me. And the moon traveling over the ribbed bottom, which was strewed with the wrecks of the forest. Formerly I had come to this pond adventurously from time to time in dark summer nights and with a companion, making a fire close to the water's edge, which we thought attracted the fishes. We caught hornets with a bunch of worms strung on a thread, and when we had done far in the night through the burning brands high into the air like skyrockets, which coming down into the pond were quenched with a loud hissing. We were suddenly groping in total darkness, though this wishing it to, and we took our way to the haunts of men again. But now I had made my home by the shore. Sometimes after staying in a village parlor, Till the family had all retired, I have returned to the woods, and partly with a view to the next day's dinner, spent the hours of midnight fishing from a boat by moonlight, serenaded by owls and foxes, and hearing from time to time the creaking note of some unknown bird close at hand. These experiences were very memorable and valuable to me. Anchored in 40 feet of water and 20 or 30 rods from the shore, surrounded sometimes by thousands of small perch and shiners, dimpling the surface with their tails in the moonlight and communicating by a long flaxen line with mysterious nocturnal fishes which had their dwelling 40 feet below, or sometimes dragging 60 feet of line. About the pond, as I drifted in the gentle night breeze, now and then feeling a slight vibration along it, indicative of some life prowling about its extremity, a dull, uncertain, blundering purpose there, and slow to make up its mind. At length, you slowly raise, pulling hand over hand, some horned pout, squeaking and squirming to the upper air. It was very clear, especially in dark nights, when your thoughts had wandered to vast and cosmogonal themes in outer spheres, to feel this faint jerk which came to interpret your dreams and link you to nature again. It seemed as if I might next cast my line upward into the air as well as downward into the element, which was scarcely more dense, thus I caught Two fishes, as I will, with one hook. How do you do that? <laughs> oh, the abstract cosmic fish. <laughs> what did he catch there? What's he mean? Now it's like English class time. <laughs> Question and answer period. <laughs> what's the two fish that he caught? <laughs> On one, one hook. Huh. That would be annoying if my English teacher asked me that. I would be annoyed. Tell him that I wasn't going to write an essay on it. <laughs> that would be annoying. <laughs> what? Nothing. You don't know. 
The scenery of Walden is on a humble scale and so very beautiful. Does not approach to grandeur, nor can it much concern one who has not long frequented it and was quite sure yet this pond is so remarkable for its depth and purity as to merit a particular description. It is a clear and deep green well, half a mile long and a mile and three quarters in circumference. It's a mile and three quarters in circumference. You should know as a surveyor. And it's a half a mile long, which is pretty long. It's bigger than the Smith Pond. <laughs> half a mile long and it's a mile and three quarters in circumference contains about 61 and a half acres that's interesting 61 acres if you think of a 61 acre field which is pretty big a perennial spring in the midst of pine and oak woods uh, without any visible inlet or outlet except by the clouds and evaporation the surrounding hills rise abruptly from the water to the height of 40 to 80 feet. There seems to be hills on the side. I don't know what forms Walden Pond. Though on the southeast and east they attain to about 100 and 150 feet respectively within a quarter and a third of a mile. It's like a big hole in the ground, Walden Pond. They are exclusively woodland. All our conquered waters have two colors, at least. One when viewed at a distance and the other more properly close at hand. The first depends more on the light and follows the sky. In clear weather in summer, they appear blue at a little distance, especially if agitated, and at a great distance, all appear alike. In stormy weather, they are sometimes as dark slat color the sea, however, is said to be blue one day and green another without any perceivable change in the atmosphere. I have seen our river, when the landscape being covered with snow, both water and ice were almost as green as grass. Some consider blue to be the color of pure water, whether liquid or solid, but looking directly down into our waters from above, they are seen to be of very different colors. Walden is blue at one time and green at another, even from the same point of view. Lying between the earth and the heavens, it protects of the color of both. Viewed from a hilltop, it reflects the color of the sky, but near at hand it is of a yellowish tint next the shore where you can see the sand. Then a light green, which gradually deepens to a uniform dark green in the body of the pond. In some lights viewed even from a hilltop, it is of a vivid green next to the shore. Some have referred this to the reflection of the verdure. But it is equally green there against the railroad sandbank, and in the spring, before the leaves are expanded, it may be simply the result of the prevailing blue mixed with the yellow of the sand, such as the color of its iris. This is that portion also where, in the spring, the ice being warmed by the heat of the sand reflected from the bottom and also transmitted through the earth, melts first and forms a narrow canal about the first frozen middle. Like the rest of our waters, when much agitated in clear weather, so that the surface of the waves may reflect the sky at the right angle, or because there is more light mixed with it, it appears at a little distance of a darker blue than the sky itself, and at such a time, being on its surface, looking at the lighted vision as so as to see the reflection, I have discerned a matchless and indescribable light blue such as watered or changeable silks and sword blades suggest, more cerise green than the sky itself, alternating with the original dark green on the opposite sides of the waves, which last appeared, but muddy in comparison. 
It is a vitreous greenish blue, as I remember it, like those patches of the winter sky seen through the dark vistas in the west before sundown. Yet a single glance of its water held up to the light as a colorless, as an equal quantity of air it is well known that a large plate of glass will have a green tint owing as the maker said to his body. But a small piece of the same will be colorless. How large a body of Walden water will be required to reflect the green tint? I have never proved. The water of our river is black or very dark brown to one looking directly down on it, and like that of most ponds, imparts to the body of one bathing in it a yellowish tint. But this water is of such crystalline purity that the body of the bather appears to an alabaster white still more unnatural, which as the limb, limbs are magnified and distorted with wall, produces a monstrous effect, making fit study for a Michelangelo. The water is so transparent that the bottom can easily be discerned at the depth of 25 or 30 feet. Paddling over it, you may see many feet beneath the surface, the schools of perch and china perhaps only an inch long. <laughs> yet the former are easily distinguished by their transverse bars, and you think that they must be ascetic fish that find a subsistence there. Once in the winter, many years ago, when I had been cutting holes through the ice in order to cut pickerel, as I stepped ashore, I tossed my axe back onto the ice, but as if some evil genius had directed it, it slid four or five rods directly into one of the holes. Where the water was twenty-five feet deep, out of curiosity, I lay down on the ice and looked through the hole until I saw the axe a little on one side, standing on its head, with its heave erect and gently swaying to and fro with the pulse of the pond. And there it might have stood erect and swaying till, in the course of time, the handle rotted off. If I had not had not disturbed it, making another hole directly over it with an, with an ice chisel which I had, and cutting down the longest perch which I could find in the neighborhood with my knife, I made a slip noose. <laughs> you know how to make a slip noose? <laughs> which I attached to its end and letting it down carefully, passed it over the knob of the handle and drew it by a line along the birch, and so pulled the axe out again. <laughs> you don't remember this. <laughs> I don't remember it. <laughs> he pulled his axe out of the water with, under the ice. <laughs> hmm. Well, that's a big deal. <laughs> we had ice when ice in the pond and we played hockey. We didn't fish in winter. We played hockey. More fun than ice fishing. <laughs> the shore is composed of a belt of smooth rounded white stones like paving stones excepting one or two short sand beaches and so it's so steep that in many places a single leap will carry you into water over your head. Hmm. And were it not for its remarkable transparency, that would be the last to be seen of its bottom till it rose on the opposite side. Some think it is bottomless. Do you think there's a bottomless pit to leave to a... <laughs> Some think it is bottomless. <laughs> You could say that the depth of the row is bottomless. It is nowhere muddy, and a casual observer would say that there were no weeds at all in it, and of noticeable plants, except in the little meadows recently overflowed, which do not properly belong to it. A closer scrutiny does not detect the flag, nor a bush rush, nor even a belly yellow or white, but only a few small heart leaves and pata no chiton. <laughs>
hands, and perhaps a water target or two, all which, however, a bather might not proceed. And these plants are clean and bright like the elemental throne. The stones extend a rod or two into the water, and then the bottom is pure sand, except in the deepest parts, where there is usually as little sun to mourn. Probably from the decay of the leaves which have been waked onto it, so many successive falls from the bright green weed is brought up on anchors, even in midsummer, midwinter. We have one other pond just like this. <coughs> White pond. I didn't know he talked about more ponds. White pond in nine acre corner, about two and a half miles westerly. And though I am acquainted with most of the ponds within a dozen miles of the center, I do not know a third of this pure and well liked character who likes white pond. Successive nations, perchance, have drank at, admired, and fathomed it, and passed away, and still its water is green and Lucid as ever, not an intermittent spring. Perhaps on that spring morning when Adam and Eve were driven out of Eden, Walden Pond was already in existence, and even then breaking up in a gentle spring rain accompanied with a mist and southerly wind and covered with myriads of ducks and geese, which had not heard of the fall. When still such pure lakes sufficed them, even then, it had commenced to rise and fall, and had clarified its waters and colored them of the hue they now wear, obtained a patent of heaven to be the only Walden Pond in the world, and distiller of celestial dews. <laughs> Who knows in how many unremembered nations the literatures thus have been the Castilian fountain, or what nymphs presided over it in the Golden Age. It is a gem of the first water, which conquered wares in her coronet. Yet perchance the first who came to this well has left some trace of their footsteps I have been surprised to detect. Encircling the pond, even where a thick wood has been just been cut down on the shore, a narrow shell-like path in the steep hillside, alternating, rising and falling, advancing and receding from the water's edge, as old probably as the race of man here, worn by the feet of aboriginal hunters and still from time to time, unwittingly trodden by the present occupants of the land. This is particularly distinct of one standing on the middle of the pond in winter, just after a light snow has fallen, appearing as a clear undulating white line unobscured by weeds and twigs and very obvious a quarter of a mile off in many places where in summer it is hardly disguisable close at hand. The snow reprints it and as it were in clear white type alto relievo the alden ornamented grounds of villas which will one day be built here may still perverse, preserve some trace of this. Hmm. The pond rises and falls, but whether regular, rarely, or not, and within what period, nobody knows, though, as usual, many pretend to know. Do you think people pretend to know things? It is commonly higher in the winter and lower in the summer, though not corresponding to the general wet and dryness. We can remember when it was a foot or two lower, and also when it was at least five feet higher than when I lived by it. There is a narrow sandbar running into it with very deep water on one side, on which I helped boil a kettle of chowder some six rods from the main shore about the year 1824, which has not been possible to do for 25 years. And on the other hand, my friends used to listen with incredulity when I told them that I Two years later, I was accustomed to fish from a boat in a secluded cove in the woods, 15 rods from the only shore they knew. The place was long since converted into a meadow, but the pond has risen steadily for two years, and now in the summer of 52, is just five feet higher than when I lived there. Or as high as it was 30 years ago, and fishing goes on again in the meadow. 
This makes a difference of level at the outset of six or seven feet, yet the watershed by the surrounding hills is insignificant in amount, and this overflow must be referred to causes which affect the deep springs. And the same summer, the pond has begun to fall again. It is remarkable that this fluctuation, whether periodic or not, appears thus to require many years for its accomplishment. I have observed one rise in the part of two falls, and I expect that a dozen or fifteen years since the water will again be as low as I have ever known it. Flint ponds, a mile eastward, allowing for the disturbance occasioned by its inlets and outlets in the Smaller intermediate ponds also sympathize with Baldwin and recently obtained their greatest leg at the same time with the latter. Same is true as far as my observation goes of White Pond. This rise and fall of Baldwin at long intervals serves this use at least. The water standing at this great height for one year or more, though it makes it difficult to walk around, it kills the shrubs and trees which have sprung up above its edge since the last rise. Birches, alders, aspens, and others, and the falling again leaves an unobstructed shore, where unlike many ponds and all waters which are subject to a daily tide, its shore is cleanest when the water is lowest. On the side of the pond, next to my eyes, a row of peach ponds, fifteen feet or high, had been tilled and chipped over as if by a lower level and thus a stop put to their encroachment from their size indicates how many years have elapsed since the last rise to this height. By this fluctuation, the pond asserts its title to a shore, and thus the shore is shorn. When the trees cannot hold it by right of position, these are the lips of the lake on which no beard grows. It licks its chaps from time to time. When the water is at its height, the alders and willows and mellows Spring forth a mass of fibrous red roots several feet long from all sides of their stems in the water, and to the height of three or four feet above the ground in an effort to maintain themselves. And I have known my blue berry bushes about the shore, which commonly produce no fruit, bear an abundant crop under these circumstances. <sighs> Some have been puzzled to tell how the shore became so regularly paved. My announcement have all heard the tradition, the oldest people tell me that they heard it in their youth, that anciently the owners were holding a powwow upon a hill here, which rose as high into the heavens as the pond now sinks deep into the earth. And they used much profanity as the story goes, though this vice was one of which the Indians were never guilty. And while they were thus engaged, the hill shook and suddenly sank, and only one old squaw named Walden escaped. Hmm. Only one old squaw named Walden escaped from her. The pond was named. Interesting. It has been conjectured that when the hill shook, these stones rolled down its side and became the present shore. It is very certain at any rate that once there was no pond here, and now there is. And this Indian fable does not in any respect conflict with the account of that ancient settler whom I have mentioned, who remembers so well when he first came here with his divining rod, saw a thin vapor rising from the sward. And the hazel pointed steadily downward, and he concluded to dig a well here. As for the stones, many still think that there are hardly to be accounted for by the action of the waves on these hills, but I observe that the surrounding hills are remarkably full of the same kinds of stones, so that they have been obliged to pile them up in walls on both sides of the railroad, cut near the pond, and moreover, there are most stones where the shore is most abrupt, so that unfortunately it is no longer a mystery to me. I detect the paver. The name is not derived from that of some English locality. Saffron Walden, for instance, one might suppose that it was called originally Walden Pond. <laughs> hmm. You think it's Walden Pond? Walled in by stones. 
Now and now there is walled in. I didn't know that about walled in pond. The pond was my well ready dug. For four months in the year, its waters are cold as pure at all times, and I think that it is then as good as any, if not the best in town. In the winter, all water, which is exposed to the air, is colder than springs. And wells, which are protected from it, the temperature of the pond water, which has stood in the well where I sat from five o'clock in the afternoon till noon the next day, the sixth of March, 1846, the thermometer had been up to 65 or 70 some of the time, owing partly to the sun on the roof, was 42 degrees, or one degree colder than the water of one of the coldest wells in the village just drawn. The temperature of the boiling spring the same day was 45 degrees, or the warmest of any water try, though it is the coldest that I know of in summer. And besides shadow, shallow and stagnant surface water is not mingled with it. Moreover, in summer, Walden never becomes so warm as most water which is exposed to the sun. On account of a step in the warmest wind weather, I usually place the pail full in my cellar, where it became cool in the night and remained so during the day, though I also resorted to a spring in the neighborhood, and it was as good when a week old as the day it was put and had no taste of the pump. Whatever camps were well weak in the summer by the shore of the pond, whoever camps were a week in the summer by the shore of the pond needs only bury a pail of water a few feet deep in the shade of his camp to be independent of the luxury of life. There have been caught in Walden Pickerel, one weighing seven pounds, to say nothing seven pound fish a pickerel to say nothing of another which carried off a reel with great velocity which the fisherman safely set down at eight pounds because he did not see them perch and pout some of each weighing over two pounds shiners and chivins and roach and a very few breams and a couple of eels one weighing four pounds I am thus particular because the weight of a fish is commonly its only title to fame, and these are the only eels I have heard of here. Also, I have a faint recollection of a little fish some five inches long with silvery sides and a greenish back, somewhat taste like in its character, which I mention here. Chiefly to link my facts to fable, nevertheless, this pond is not very for tired and fish. When are you going to make coffee? Hmm? Hmm. This picaro, although not abundant, are its chief boast. I have seen at one time lying on the ice picaro of at least three different kinds. A long and shallow one, steel colored, most like those caught in the river, a bright golden kind, with greenish reflections and remarkable deep. This is the most common air, and another golden colored and shaped like the last, but peppered on the sides with small, dark brown and black spots, intermixed with a few faint red, blood red ones, very much like a trout. Specific name Reticulosus would not apply to this. It should be goop of fish rather. These are all very firm fish and weigh more than their size promises. The shiners, pouts, and perch also, and indeed all the fishes which inhabit this pond are much cleaner, handsomer, and firmer in flesh than those in the river and most other ponds, as the water is pure and they can easily be distinguished from them. Probably some ichthyologist would make new varieties of some of them. These are also a clean race of frogs and tortoises and a few mussels and much muskrats and minks. These are traces about it and occasionally a traveling mud turtle visits it. Sometimes when I pushed off my boat in the morning, I disturbed a great mud turtle which had secreted himself under the boat in the night. 
Ducks and geese frequented in the spring and fall, and the white dollars swallows skim over it, and the peak wood bleats teeter along its stony shores all summer. I have sometimes disturbed a fish hawk by twittering on a white pine over the water, but I doubt if it is ever profaned by the wing of a gull like Fairhaven. Alas, it tolerates one annual lean. These are all the animals of consequence which frequent it now. You may see from a boat in calm weather near the sandy eastern shore, where the water is eight or ten feet deep, and also in some other parts of the pond, some circular heaps half a dozen feet in diameter by a foot in height consisting of small stones less than a hen's egg in size for all around is bare of sand at first you wonder if the indians could have formed them on the ice for any purpose and so when the ice melted they sank to the bottom for they are too regular and some of them plainly, plainly too fresh for that they are similar to those found in rivers but as there are no suppers nor lambos here i know not by what fish they could be made. Perhaps they are the nest of the chicken. These land a pleasing mystery to the bottom. It's all about ponds. The shore is irregular enough not to be monotonous. I have in my mind's eye the western indented with deep bays, the broad and northern and the beautifully scarlet southern shore where successive capes overlap each other and suggest unexplored coves between. The forest has never so good a setting nor is so distinctly beautiful as one seen from the middle of a small lake in the hills which rise from the water's edge, for the water in which it is reflected not only makes the best foreground in such a case, but with its winding shore the most natural and agreeable boundary to it. Makes a good picture, in other words. <laughs> See, less than a photograph. <laughs> he was posting to Instagram. He said, take a shot from the boat. <laughs> so we're trying to locate good places for Instagram. Yeah, they're entertaining the people. They're entertaining for Instagram. <laughs> We're exploring Walden to figure out where to take Instagram photos. <laughs> What's the purpose, Phil? This reading is for you to hear it. <laughs> it's just for you. Maybe. <laughs> How can they take an Instagram from this? They would have to go there. <laughs> There is no rawness nor imperfection in its edge there as well, or the axe has cleared apart, or a cultivated field of butts on the roots of trees have ample room to expand on the water side, and each sends forth its most vigorous branch in that direction. Their nature has woven a natural salvage and salvage on the rise rise by just gradations from the low shrubs of the shore to the highest tree. There are a few traces of man's hand to be seen. The water leaves the shore as it did a thousand years ago. Oh, lake is the landscape's most beautiful and expressive feature. It is the eye, the earth's eye, looking into which the beholder measures the depth of his own nature. The fur foliatile trees next to shore are the slender eyelashes which fringe it, and the wooded hills and cliffs around are its overhanging brows. Standing on the smooth sandy beach at the east end of the pond in a calm September afternoon, when a slight haze makes the opposite shoreline indistinct, I have seen whence came the expression, the glassy, 
surface of a lake where you invert your head. It looks like a thread of thread of finest gossamer stretch across the valley and gleaming against the distant pine woods, separating one stratum of the atmosphere from another. You would think that you could walk dry under it to the opposite hills and not to swallow, swallow to skim over my perch on it. Indeed, they sometimes dive and mine below the line as it were by mistake and are undeceived. As you look over the pond they westward, you are obliged to employ both your hands and turn your eyes against the reflected as well as the true sun, for they are equally bright, and if between the two you survey its surface critically, it is literally as smooth and as glass, except where the skater intersects at equal intervals scattered over its full extent by those their motions in the sun produce the finest and that if it sparkle on it or perchance a duck plums itself or as i have said a swallow skims so low as to touch it it may be that in the distance a fish describes an arc of two or four feet in the air and there is one bright flash where it emerges Another where it strikes the water, sometimes the whole silvery arch is revealed, or here and there perhaps a fish to sit down, floating on the surface, which the fishes dart at, and so different it to dim. It is like molten glass, cool but not congealed, and the few moths in it are pure and beautiful, like the imperfections in glass you may often detect at yet, smoother and darker water, separated from the rest as if by an invisible cobweb. Boon of the water nymphs resting on it. From a hilltop, you can see a fish leap into almost any part, for not a patrol or shiner picks an insect from the smooth surface, but it manifestly disturbs the equilibrium of the whole lake. It is wonderful with what elaborateness the simple fact is advertised. This first sheen murder will out, and from my distant perch I Distinguish the circling undulations when they are half a dozen rods in diameter. You can even detect the water bug therein as ceaselessly progressing over the smooth surface a quarter of a mile off. For they furrow the water slightly, making a conspicuous ripple bounded by two diverging lines, but the skaters glide over it without rippling in it perceivably when the surface is considerably agitated there are no skaters nor water bogs on it but apparently in calm days they leave their havens and adventurously glide forth from the shore to sh by short impulses till they are completely covered it is a smoothing employment on one of these fine days in the fall when all the warmth of the sun is fully appreciated to sit on a stump on such a height of this overlooking the pond and study the dimpling circles which are incessantly inscribed on its otherwise invisible surface amid the reflected skies and trees over this great expanse there is no disturbance but it is thus at once gently smoothed away and assuraged assuraged as when a vast of water is jarred and the trembling circles seek the shore and all is smooth again not a fish can leap or an insect fall on the pond, but it is thus reported in circling dimples and lines, a beauty as it were the constant welling up of its fountain, the gentle plump pulsing, pulsing of its life, the heaving of its breast, the thrills of its joy and thrills of pain are indescribable. How peaceful the phenomenon of the lake. Again, the works of man shine as in the spring. A every leaf and twig and stone and cobweb sparkles now at midday afternoon as when covered with dew in a spring morning. Every motion of an oar or an instinct insect produces a flash of light. And if an oar falls, how sweet the echo. idea of the pond mm. 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 it goes on and on to stop mm. Mm. but the echo how sweet the echo of Walden Pond <laughs> I'm going to stop there with the echo 
So this can be quite a simple equation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.